This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. We're back at the Nipah Virus International Conference in Singapore, recognizing discovery of this virus 20 years ago. And my guest is president of EcoHealth Alliance, Peter Dashak. Welcome to TWIV. Why is it to be here? Dashak, is that good? That's great. Perfect. Where are you from? I'm from the UK, but the name's Ukrainian. Really? Yeah, yeah. So at some point your family moved my, from... My dad was Ukrainian. Ukraine. I want our listeners, and we have many, between 10 and 20,000 science aficionados, including scientists. I want to learn about the EcoHealth Alliance. What is it? Well, we're a, we're a non-profit, a typical charity. 501c3, right? Yeah, 501c3 <laughs> in the US. But we're very focused on research. So what we're trying to do, really, I guess the difference that we're trying to do is do the science and publish in the best journals you can go for. Mm -hmm. um, a typical academic strategy um, funded by federal government and other sources, but then try and take the science and do something with it on the ground. So that's the charity side. That's the, that's the 501c3 side of it. Got it. So I, I like to try and mix mm. that together. I don't do that. <laughs> I don't <laughs> no, go on you, the ground. I stay in the lab. It's, uh, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm from basic science originally, but I've always had an yeah. applied bent. And I, I just think it's good to actually see some results on the ground. It's very hard to do, of course. Yeah. But I think as this meeting shows, it is increasingly important that you oh, apply yeah. Yeah. because in the end, human health is the important yeah. factor, right? We're in an applied field, so it's yeah. great to be able to see that difference. Yeah. When was it founded, the Alliance? Well, we've been around for a long time, uh -huh. over 45 years. It was originally set up as a conservation group, Wildlife Trust. I see. And it was, um, it was linked to a British organization. No one linked to me. It was just mm -hmm. that's how it started, and I eventually took over. Yeah. Oh, so you... It started long before you joined. So long before okay. I joined, and it was it. purely conservation, mm -hmm. and health programs started to come into it. One, one of the reasons was a lot of the field workers were getting sick with pretty unusual mm. diseases. So there was a bit of an interest in this, and the health programs proved kind of so interesting and well-funded and well-supported and well-liked on the ground yeah. that yeah. they took over. I think it's you're, you're headquartered in New York, yeah, right? It's funny city, that yeah. here we are in Singapore, we yeah. were talking. We never got together in New York. <laughs> That's pretty ridiculous. It's in crazy. fact, I'm an adjunct at Columbia, so I don't know why we've never. Right. But there you go. So here we are. Um, I'd like to know a little bit about your your history before going to uh, the Alliance. Where you're from the UK, you from said. UK, and I did. Uh, I sort of went through. I was always interested in nature as a kid, yeah. so I wanted to do zoology. Ever, ever since I was, you know, eight years old, I wanted to be a zoologist. And um, I was on that track. I did a zoology degree. I was going to work on, I'm, I'm a reptile fan. Mm. I wanted to work on reptiles. And then in England, you have, in your third year, you have to pick a research project. And I was late to the table. And the only one left on reptiles was, there was no good behavior stuff. You couldn't go to the jungle and watch <laughs> them. It was um, ultrastructure of a parasite in a lizard's gallbladder. Huh. Okay, well, I'll do it anyway. But it was <laughs> it was so fascinating. I just got hooked on okay. um, on research. I got hooked on seeing something for the first time and getting a result that tells you something that no one else has seen. It's, I, I found that fascinating. Mm -hmm. So you decided to get a PhD? Yeah, I, did, I, I got a PhD in a similar field. I got a PhD in coccidiosis. Okay. That was the parasite. Where did you do that? Um, in, in England, in London. Yeah, University of East London. Okay. And did you do a postdoc after that? Yeah, I did a couple of postdocs. It was in a pretty bad time in England. It was a one, there were one year postdocs. Mm. Kept getting refunded, but it's not a great, um, you know, great support. What areas were they in? Um, in, um, oh, similar stuff, parasitology. But I was, I was a sort of general, because I could do electron microscopy. Oh, okay. I would okay. work on a bunch of different projects. I guess you know my colleague Dixon de Pommier, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he's yeah. always mentioned you. Yeah, he's great. He always he's says we have to get Peter on the show, and <laughs> I don't know why it's yeah. so hard being in New York City. And, and then after these uh, postdocs, did you join the Alliance? It's uh, No, really, what happened was my wife got a job. Mm -hmm. She's from the UK as well. She got a, offered this job in the, U, in the US, and... We sort of thought about it for a year or so, and eventually it was a great job for a biotech company in Atlanta, and I gave up my job and came over as her tag-along on a visa. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, and you have to wait a while to, before you get your work permit. So she said, you should go and volunteer. And I thought, well, when am I going to do that? Yeah. <laughs> so I volunteered at CDC. And it was during the Nipah virus outbreak. And I was in the lab yeah. doing electron microscopy on the first samples that came over. So that Nipah connection went right back to then. I was just volunteering. It was cool. Wow, that's amazing, especially yeah. since we've heard that at this meeting, right? Yeah, and I saw some of the pictures that I worked on. Yeah, and there, that's when it was clear it was not Japanese encephalitis yeah. virus, right? Yeah, well, it, yeah, by then, by then they knew that it, yeah. was, it was something unusual, Hendra-like. And at that point they said, let's work on it more carefully than we've been so far, right? BSL-4? Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, up until then it was, it was a JE suspect, so it was in a bit, I guess, BSL-2 plus right. situation. Right. Yeah. Pretty risky. Well, I heard that for years they used to work on Marburg in Germany in just glove boxes before they realized yes, and before right. BSL-4 and it was yes, okay. Surprise, Nobody got it? sick. <laughs> yeah. when Not did a you, good thing. When did you join the Alliance? Well, I, I yes, yeah, so I worked, um, I went over to University of Georgia for a while, did uh, some research on amphibian disease. I was still doing the wildlife stuff. And then, um, and then I just applied for a job at that in 2000, mm -hmm. 2001, something like that. And you worked your way up. I, I, got, I got a job as coordinating a project between five universities and, right. and the, what was then called the Wildlife Trust. And then it just got so well funded that the health programs were so well supported that they kind of took over. And then the president left and I, um, and I got offered the job so okay. about 10 years ago. So if I came to your offices, where, where are they located? Midtown, Midtown. 34th and 10th. If I came, would I see offices or labs or both? You'll see offices and you'll see folks doing, you know, economic modeling, mm -hmm. um, analytics, you know, um, uh, sequence crunching. Right. The labs are all around the world, including, in, in, I mean, we work a lot with Ian Lipkin up at Columbia. Right. Um, but every country we work in, we have a lab partner that's a good lab. And if there isn't a lab there, we build one or we get funding to kit it out. I that's, see. that's the strategy. And so uh, you have employees, obviously, right? Yeah. Who, yeah. How, how do you decide what you need? You don't hire lab people, I guess. You hire computer people. Well, we, we hire lab people too. I mean, what we do is we, I guess my strategy is, it, is to limit the bureaucracy. This is the, really one of the key benefits about being um, outside of the academic system, mm -hmm. you do miss a lot from universities. You know, you're in, you're out on your own. You know, there's no support. But one of the great mm -hmm. things is you're free to quickly change. So you can you can hire people quickly and yeah. out, out out of the box or from different disciplines. And what I like to do is mix up a lot of different um, disciplines together in a room. So when you're brainstorming what you're going to do about an issue. You've got an economist, a mathematician, mm -hmm. you know, a, a veterinary, um, a, a microbiologist, and, and they're all in the same room thinking about this one issue. And that's really what, what I think is successful and gets me excited about it. So you have a lot of meetings with not just people in, in New York, but in all your oh, yeah. remote yeah. sites as well. We were, we were early adopters of video conferencing. Right. And in fact, it's great. We, during the recession, we got, um, you remember the American Restoration Recovery Act? Yes, I do. So we got ARA funding for a video conference facility uh -huh. because it reduced our federal, you know, demand on federal money so we could have these meetings and stuff. Without traveling. Yeah. So we, we're um, always on conference calls, uh, you know, two, twice a week, late night conference mm -hmm. calls mm -hmm. to Asia, um, Africa, and right. Latin America. So, right. Yeah. So... Uh, how do you pay for all this? You have people give money, right? Raise money, yeah. And uh, we, you know, another advantage of being a 501c3 is we have this history of being a charitable sort of conservation, saving wildlife organization. So we've got all the major donors that support that. We've got the public that donate. We have a charity uh, gala in New York every year. So we have all these sort of nonprofit things we do. But over 80% of our funds comes from federal support. So we, mm -hmm. like a u university department, we're going after federal money all oh, the time. Yeah. Okay. Is, is it difficult to raise enough money for your needs? Uh, well, it's great when you get it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know what, it's not easy, is it? I mean, it's pretty brutal, isn't it? I mean, if you look at your success rate on federal grants, I guess the average is 10% or something. So we've probably hit an above average, mm. but it's just hard to spend so much time on a grant and sure. then 
it gets rejected. No, I, it's upsetting. I'm very aware of that because that's how we support our lab. It's getting harder yeah. because more and more people are coming in the field. It feels good, but it's very competitive. And the money has not gone up sufficiently. The problem is when the money does go up, it doesn't matter because the universities grab it for, <laughs> for well, making we, buildings. We have an overhead, <laughs> but of course, that's the other thing. You're a small organization. Everyone knows where the overhead's going. We, yeah, you yeah. know, there's no... You see the benefits of that because it goes right back to you. So that's another slight advantage. Do you have support from, say, Gates Foundation? No, we don't. We've never got Gates money. And I think that Gates, Gates had a strategy of specifically targeting things that they considered neglected, diseases that were neglected. We're working on what they consider not neglected diseases. Even NEPA, which isn't a big pandemic um, issue mm-hmm. every year. To, to Gates, it's considered um, neglected, uh, not neglected. But they're, they're kind of moving into this space a little bit more, but we've never got funds from Gates. It's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I guess, judging from this meeting, NEPA is not neglected. Right? No, not right now. No, no it's good. A lot of people, which yeah. is good. But on the other hand, um, well, he, he can decide where to put his money. But there, are other, right. there I, are other I, I, charities I also. But you Oh, know. yeah, yeah. I mean, we get money from foundations. We get money from mm-hmm. private sector. So one of the things we've been trying to do is we work a lot on the underlying causes of pandemics, deforestation, climate change, wildlife hunting. That's our conservation side as well. Mm-hmm. So we go to foundations and say, look, you've been trying to stop the wildlife trade in China for 20 years. You've put all this money into it. If you have a health angle to that, it really does work. Yeah. The, the markets, the wildlife markets in China were never closed down because of you know, uh, ethical concerns or mm-hmm. conservation. But the minute SARS emerged, they closed them down. Right. So that's right. the argument we use, and we're trying to put the health in conservation. I see. So give me um, an overview. You said you have labs throughout the world that you work with. Are they, they're not employees of yours, though. You contract um, them or some us- of them are? Usually we subcontract to labs, but we usually try and have, in every country, a country program officer. Right. who manages the work we do in our okay. country, um, sometimes regional. And um, we often hire um, technicians in labs or PhD students, mm-hmm. you know, to have a have a presence in the lab. There's more of a buy-in when you've got a person there. Okay. And um, in these in these remote locations, like John Epstein, for example, who yeah. is at this meeting and is involved in surveillance. He's mostly in New York, but he'll go to field sites periodically and do yeah. work as well. Do you do that? Do you go out in the field? Yeah, ever? I still, I still do. I, I, my, uh, I have two countries that I still kind of am in charge of mm-hmm. in, in the organization, China and Malaysia. Okay. I've got a long-term history of working in Malaysia, so does John. Um, so I go out there a heck of a lot. And, right. uh, okay. Yeah. So the point is to establish capabilities in other countries, not just take specimens from them and bring them yeah, home, right? It, it, that's right. That's the strategy. And, you know, it's this, the old adage that if you teach people how to do it and mm. give them the capacity and the tools, then you've really made a difference. And it, sure. the money always dries up. And this is something we've seen in the nonprofit world. You get great funding for five years from a foundation. They always shift priorities because that's what they've got to yeah, do. They've got yeah, to keep yeah, it sure, fresh. Sure. So if you've built a structure and trained people, they're in their own country raising money locally. Yeah. You've left it. That's the alliance part of what we okay. call, you know. How many countries would you say you're in? Right now, it's probably about 30 countries. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's talk about some of the programs. I was uh, perusing ecohealthalliance.org. Uh, you probably, when, when you, it started, there were no websites, but now everyone can see it. <laughs> That's right. So let's talk about a few of these. They're really interesting. And then not, not all of them have to do with viruses, right? Yeah, that's right. Some of them do. Some of them have to do with other things. So there's one about establishing biosurveillance networks in Western Asia. Oh, WabiNet. And uh, yes, yeah. you have nice acronyms for all of these. Well, everything's got an acronym. <laughs> WebiNet. Why Western Asia, which is about where we are, right? No, Western Asia is very specifically sort of the stands, the, um, you know, uh, Pakistan, okay. uh, Kyrgyzstan, all these places. Uh-huh. There are there are um, the countries that need support, so they get a lot of U.S. U.S. development money. Got it. The countries that are security risk, so there's interest from DoD. And I think the funding for that comes from uh, DITRA, 
Defense Threat Reduction right. Agency. Right. And the idea is you're training scientists to um, do good work and learn how to live and function within the modern uh, science mm -hmm. community. Are there any particular threats that you're interested in that region? Oh, there's, there's uh, a lot of pretty unpleasant pathogens out there. <laughs> Plague is still okay. out there. Um, no one's really done deep surveys of bats out there and the viruses they carry. We expect they're going to carry similar viruses to Hendra and Nipah, yeah, yeah. Um, SARS and others. So that's what we're looking at in that. So that's something you'd, you'd want to do, survey bats. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then there's the Western Asia Bat Research Oh, that's, yeah, Network. yeah. Okay. That's that one, right? Yeah, yeah. That's got an acronym too. WABAR, I think. And you, yeah. So it's also Western Asia looking for yeah. viruses and bats. Uh, and then there's another program for Rift Valley yeah. Fever. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, Rift, Rift is, you know, I think people talk a lot about One Health. Rift is a classic One Health mm -hmm. disease. It's a human, wildlife, and livestock disease. And, you know, we think we know a lot about these things. I mean, I'm always fascinated. <laughs> you, you, you talk about, should we do some work on Rift a few years ago? Well, no, everything's known. People know what's going on. There's predictive models that show when you should move the vaccine supply to prevent outbreaks. Mm -hmm. So as good as it gets, there's a vaccine. But it turns out that there are huge gaps. For instance, you know, there are these very long gaps between outbreaks, mm -hmm. sometimes 10 years, more than 10 years. The virus is out there, and the, the mantra is that it's in, in um, mosquito eggs dr and dried out um, right. dambos. And then when it floods, they pop up, and out comes the virus. But it turns out there's actually some evidence of cycling in wildlife, wild antelopes and others. So we're mm -hmm. looking at that and trying to say whole systems approach, a real One Health approach. What's going on in wildlife, and does that allow the virus to cause risk to farmers Right. Even outside of those outbreaks. Right. So you're sampling wildlife and looking for yeah. the virus. Yeah. Sampling wildlife, okay. sheep, people, mosquitoes, soil, the whole gamut. So currently they vaccinate cows, right? Cattle. Yeah. Yeah. And sheep. Yeah. And sheep. But that doesn't prevent the virus from circulating in, in wildlife. Yeah, that's right. Obviously. It's in ungulates and, and they're out there in the wild. So, so if you find virus out there, what do you do about that? Is a, I mean, you can immunize the cattle. But what about people? What we're doing is we're working with farmers and the, yeah. the target audience, and it's in South Africa, this, so the target audience is sheep farmers who care about losing sheep. Um, the ultimate bigger picture is pandemic risk and movement of the virus into, yeah. you know, bigger, bigger areas. So we're, we're working with farmers to say, can we predict better when to vaccinate? Is it, you know, it's not always just once every few years. It might be yeah, yeah. once a herd immunity drops below a certain threshold virus is going to come from the wild ungulates into the, the flock. So that's right. the target. So currently this is an African disease. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you mentioned on your website, people worry about it spreading elsewhere. Yeah. Right? Is that realistic? Oh, I, yeah. Because one of the things about Rift is it, it um, once it gets into livestock, it can then be transmitted directly from blood and meat into yeah. people. So it becomes a huge risk for people butchering animals and that the big event is the Hajj where everybody has to butcher and eat a sheep you know lamb whatever right. so there's this um mm -hmm. high risk around the Hajj CDC is aware of it WHO is aware of it and they monitor and Saudi Arabia does a great job monitoring the Hajj but what about these other areas these other regions and these other risks Okay. It's definitely a pandemic risk for sure. Could it get into the US even? Yeah through through meat or meat through, coming in yeah yeah, yeah. That's the, um now, it's mosquito transmitted, you said? Yeah. What kind of mosquitoes? Okay. Or do we have yeah. them here in the U.S.? We have some here in the U.S., okay. so there's, there's a possibility of that too. Yeah, but I'm not a mosquito expert. Do you worry about, what is it, um, African swine fever? Yeah, well, we've been, we've been working in China for many years, and mm. China's took a huge hit from yeah. African swine fever right now. And, um, you know, the price of pork's gone up. That's a big issue. Um, they're the biggest consumer of pork on the planet, biggest producer. Right. They're importing U.S. pork, so that's good for U.S. producers, but it's just not good for the planet. And um, you think about other countries in the region that are less mm. biosecure than China, um, it's, it's a threat to yeah. everywhere. Are you, are you, do you have people in China working we, on this? We, we've been working in China for years, but not on African swine fever. We, we actually discovered um, another disease in pigs, mm -hmm. Um, swine acute diarrheal syndrome that 
that SADS. emerged. SADS, yeah, yes. good acronym. <laughs> that emerged out of bats and uh, just, you know, the capacity for these viruses to pop up uh, seemingly out of nowhere and cause 25,000 pig deaths and for that to go unnoticed for a long time is incredible. And, and when you think about the huge production of pork in China, diseases that look like another disease, it's a Darrell disease, looks like a PD, PDV, mm -hmm. um, can just get missed. And yeah. that, that's the, the worrying part. Right. Now, in all these places we're talking about, you have people who are supported by you. They're paid by yeah. you and they're working locally. And you periodically interact with them and see yeah. was, and provide advice. And do Pe they periodically is every day, every day. Yeah. So they, they don't mind that. They appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> so it's like, it depends who they are. I mean, look, we, we have, um, our staff in countries yeah. funded directly. We have subcontracts through local universities or agencies in mm -hmm. country. And then we, then we have contracts to do work and right. yeah, we, we, it's all collaborative science. So people love to interact on collaborative science. I, you know, what I've found, especially in places like China, where, Increasingly, there's a paranoia around collaboration. Mm -hmm. Science collaboration is open and transparent because of the nature of what you're trying to do. You're trying to discover stuff quickly, understand what it means, publish it in a high impact journal. And that drives openness and transparency. And that's been great for us around the world. It's also great for the US. And that's, we really need to push that agenda, I think. Yeah. Publishing is a very interesting mechanism. You have to publish. Yeah. And by then, when you publish, everyone has it. Yeah, to use. it's kind of unusual, <laughs> right? yeah. yeah. It's called, I spoke to an economist recently, she said it's making a public good out of science, because yeah, if you don't yeah, publish it, you're, right. you're not recognized. And, and also the business model of science is weird as well, because we, I'll never forget, the first time I published a paper, my brother, he's an opera singer, came to visit me and he said, wow, look <laughs> at this, your name's on a paper. <laughs> cool, you know, how much did they pay you for this? I said, well, uh, nothing. <laughs> Right. In fact, we had to pay the page fees. So here's a couple of others I, I noticed. PREDICT. Yeah. That's an acronym. What does that do? It's, it's uh, not an acronym. It's, it's a <laughs> capitalized non-acronym. Oh, I see. Yeah. But it tells you what you're doing. That wasn't our name. That was USAID that came up. They came up with a whole gamut of programs in their emerging pandemic threats program. PREDICT, RESPOND, PREPARE, uh, PREVENT. There was also... Mm -hmm. <laughs> A little bit pretentious, but predict it's a great project. It's just finished, sadly. But um, ten years of surveillance mm -hmm. in wildlife, viral discovery, finding new pathogens, um, surveillance in people, trying to find evidence of those new pathogens spilling over, trying to identify where the high risk human, wildlife, livestock interfaces are on the planet, and really ultimately mm. get better at predicting where the next pandemic okay. is going to come from. Uh, another one is emerging infectious disease research. You say you're training scientists in other countries to work on that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you give them lab capabilities. Well, we, we try and um, try, we, I guess we train them in One Health approach. Why don't you explain One Health? You've mentioned that before. Yeah. I mean, so this is a, um, really pretty simple. I mean, a lot of health issues, a lot of disease issues um, have a, an environmental connection, a human connection, mm -hmm. and an animal connection. Um, we really work a lot on zoonoses now, so they're all One Health issues. But what we do a lot of is to look at the environmental side of that, what's driving that mm. disease to spread or spill over into people. So, you know, trying to understand patterns of mm -hmm. ecology, patterns of environmental change, sometimes really long-term patterns to get a better handle on what's going on on the planet. Uh, we heard a lot about that with respect to NEPA and yeah. being shed from bats, right? Yeah. We don't really know what drives peaks of shedding, right. as far as I could tell. Yeah, but there are limit. You know, there are limitations that you have to do serology most of the time. Yeah, right? yeah, it's hard because you, really you may you may be missing the actual infection, right? I mean, what we what we've done with Napa and John's John Epstein's got a paper in review right now that's pretty cool. I think using by doing a long term longitudinal study over yeah. multi years, you know, you get around the seasonal issues. You get get to see right. that. You, you don't get enough N with PCR. You get mm -hmm. a few hits because this is, these are rare viruses, even in the reservoir. Yeah, yeah. Um, to find that one week infection in a bat, you've got to sample thousands. So we did. What we found is good, good serology. And if you've got a modeler that understands 
and you've got data on when animals become seropositive, mm -hmm. how quickly immunity wanes, what the age structure of that is. You can actually look at those populations and begin to predict viral shedding peaks mm -hmm. from serology. So that's what we've done. And we've shown um, that it's not annual, it's more, more likely biannual. And it's not a seasonal issue. It's not related to birthing pulses. These bats yeah. give birth synchronously. Right. So, yeah, it's still, it's still a mystery what drives that, but we'll get there. I heard at this meeting that there are bats in other countries ha harboring Hannibal-like viruses, like South Africa. Yeah. yeah. you have a presence there at all? Yeah, we do, through uh, Vanda. Yeah, who she talked here. about yeah, it. We're, yeah. we're collaborating with Fascinating. Yeah. All right, so another area is deforestation. Explain why that's a driver of emerging infections. Well, when, when we, I mean, we changed our name um, from Wildlife Trust to Eco Health Alliance to focus more on the health side. We thought that right. was our unique nonprofit approach. Um, but we wanted to maintain the conservation angle to, to this. So we picked two big issues. One is deforestation. And the reason is it drives emergence. Mm -hmm. so in, in our global analysis of emerging infectious diseases, um, land use change is a globally significant predictor mm -hmm. of, of a pandemic risk, I guess, I guess you could say. You cut down the forest, you build a road into a patch of forest, people go in, they hunt yeah. wildlife, you get a new pathogen. Right. So what we're trying to do is, mm. is a really simple strategy. Um, if governments are chopping down forests, why are they doing it? They're doing it for economic growth. Right. You know? right. right. So what's the value of that? So you look at ecosystem services, you look at the, the value of the crops they produce. But then there's this other thing that's never been done, which is you get a new disease that emerges, can have incredible impact economically, like mm -hmm. SARS, 10 to $50 billion of impact. Um, in, in Malaysia, zoonotic malaria tracks really closely with land use change. Mm -hmm. So we went to Malaysia, we calculated the cost of every case of malaria. We put that into the equation for ecosystem yeah. services and show that palm oil production specifically mm. loses profit because you're paying for malaria. You cut the forest down, you pay for malaria cases and control for another 100 years. Sure. So there's a, there's a loss that's unaccounted for. And we're trying to show yeah. the government, you know, this is costing you money, so don't be so gung-ho about chopping all your forest down. Yeah, that's the same idea you said earlier. You close the meat markets, giving yeah. them economic yeah. health-based right. reasons, yeah. right? Another one is global wildlife trade. Yeah. What are you doing there? Well, we're trying to um, look at patterns of wildlife trade that, in, that include a risk of new diseases emerging. So we're doing a couple of things, really. So one is around SARS. We focused on SARS coronavirus emerged from a wildlife market mm -hmm. and was the first pandemic of this century. So it's a big event. Um, so we we started to trace back from the wildlife market which species carried the virus that came into those markets. We found that it was bats, not mm. civets was the original idea. Right, right. So then we started looking, where did they come from? And we went out to southern China and did surveillance of bats across southern China. And we've now found, after you know six or seven years of doing this, um, over a hundred mm. new SARS-related coronaviruses, very close to SARS, some of them get into human cells in the lab. Um, some of them right. can cause SARS disease in humanized mouse models and are untreatable uh, with uh, the therapeutic mm -hmm. monoclonals and you can't vaccinate against them with the vaccine. So these are a clear and present danger. Yeah. We've even found people with antibodies in Yunnan to SARS-related coronaviruses. So there's a human exposure. Right. We're now doing... Um, Surveillance, we're just beginning another five years of work to look at cohorts in southern China to say, well, how frequent does this spillover happen and is it associated with disease? Because I expect, just like Nipah in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. there are dozens and dozens of small spillovers going on on the planet any one time, which we just never see. Sure. Yeah, they never amplify. There are yeah. a few cases and they're yeah. just absorbed in the illness, the overall illness of the population, right? Now, you could say, so who cares? You know, and that's one argument. But our, our strategy is any one of those could become pandemic. There's a lot of stochasticity in what happens then. Yeah. So if we look yeah. at all of them, understand patterns, try and reduce the number of spillover events we've got, you know. But if you're saying these are diverse uh, coronaviruses and 
you can't vaccinate against and there are no antivirals. What, what, do, we, what do we do? Well, so I, I think that coronavirus is a pretty good, I mean, neurovirologists, you know all this stuff, but they, you can um, manipulate them in the lab pretty easily. It's yeah. just spike protein drives a lot of what happens with the yeah. coronavirus, uh, zoonotic risk. So you can get the sequence, you can build the protein, and we work with Ralph Barrick at UNC mm -hmm. to do this. Um, insert it into the backbone of another virus right. and do do some work in the lab. So you can get more predictive when you find a sequence. You've got okay. this diversity. Now, the, the logical progression for vaccines is if you're going to develop a vaccine for SARS, mm -hmm. people are going to use um, you know, pandemic SARS as yeah, the, sure, sure. but let's try and insert some of these other yeah, sure. related and, and get a better vaccine. And I guess also knowledge of what's there if you see something emerging, it give it a head start on making yeah. a vaccine or a therapeutic. That's true. And, and you know, better knowledge of where they are as well. So that yeah. you, can, you can put your money into these clinics that matter. And that's one of the big things that we've been trying to push. There's a lot of um, the word predict or the word, you know, the um, anticipating forecasting pandemics. It, it, it doesn't mean you can stop them. That's the problem. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so what we're trying to do is say, on a global scale, if we can show where they're most likely to come from, the species they're most likely to originate mm -hmm. in, the people most likely to get affected, a, a global actor like WHO or a national uh, government can better allocate resources to the highest risk. It's okay. pretty simple. So you're doing a lot of activities. Those are just a few of all the ones you can find. How do you know if you're getting results? I know you publish things, right? Yeah. Are yeah. there any other metrics you use? Yeah, well, we, it's, you're very good at um, asking the right questions there because we, we're doing our, our strategic plan right now and our board has said to us, you know, you need to monitor and evaluate better. And it's true. It, mm. It's notoriously hard to, um, to monitor conservation success. And I think this is a similar problem. You, you've got near-term indicators like a uh, number of people you've trained in villages. You know, we ha we've, we've designed these books called Living Safer with Bats, Living Safer with Wildlife, translate them into 20 odd different languages. Yeah. And, and we educate folks in villages and on these high risk interfaces, how to avoid spillover basically, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know. So near term indicator, how many people have you taught in community outreach? Yeah. Yeah. But the real indicators are, have you prevented infections? Or have you um, had a policy change in a government that reduces risk? And we've done that. I mean, it takes a few years, but we have. Hmm. You know, we, we got the amphibian disease, keratomycosis, listed as a notifiable disease with OIE. Right. Right. Um, we've got, you know, the, the Sabah government um, is blocking building into some, uh, road building into some of these forests based on the health side. So there is success, mm -hmm. but it takes a long time. So you talked about these books, uh, Living with Safe. Living safely with bats. Where, living can people get those bats. somewhere? I think you get them on our website. website? Yeah, okay. sure. Download Take a look. whatever language you. you All know. right. Um, this is an. This is one last question, which has to do with Linfa Wong. Oh yeah. Do bats have more viruses than other animals? <laughs> <laughs> Very good question, sir. <laughs> I, I've got to say, with Linfa, I stand corrected on this. I don't know. I think last time I met you, we were debating that publicly. Every spe speech we give at a conference, I would say, put my hand up, Linfa, you've still not shown mm -hmm. that bats have more viruses than any other group. Now, he never showed it. It was us that showed it. I, I challenged him, and Kevin Oliver, who works for us, spent eight years on a project trying to look at patterns of spillover from ICTV data, super complicated, huge amount of work, and correcting for the biases in the literature and Linfa was right, and we were sorely gutted, okay. but yeah. yeah was, yes. He said that at ASV this summer. He said he... He's right. He, he was right, but I just wanted to check it with you. Yeah, yeah. No, he Thank was you. correct. I was wrong. Okay. Are you having fun, by the way? I love it. Yeah, I love this work. <laughs> uh, it's, um, uh, you know, I guess you go back to your childhood dreams of being a zoologist in the Amazon. I'm, I'm not a zoologist in the Amazon, but I think that once you get hooked on research and finding new things out, it's... There's something mm. that plays to a fundamental need to discover in, in the human psyche, and it's great every day. And even when it's wrong, you know, even when you find out that um, your analysis shows, yeah. it's not a big deal after all. all it's, right. um, yeah, still. I love it. I think what you're doing is fabulous. Thanks, I appreciate and, that. And uh, keep it up. Cheers. So that is Twiv from uh, NEPA 
conference in Singapore. You can find TWIV on any podcast player. Microbe.tv slash TWIV is our website. If you have questions about anything you hear, TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us financially. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute to make a contribution. My guest on this special episode, Eco Health Alliance President Peter Daschak. Where can listeners go if they want to help you? Uh, go to ecohealthalliance.org. Great. Thank you so much for talking. My pleasure. To me. Great chatting to you. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank ASV and ASM for their support of TWIV. Thanks to Lin Fa Wang for bringing me to Singapore. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>